Well, I'm scheduled to speak in uh, Florida. I haven't got my manuscripts in yet, so we'll see. I appreciate being able to be asked to speak here again and again, and as well as for my dad to introduce me. We're going to hope we're going to get through this. My voice will hold out. <clears throat> Keeping a good and honest heart. As Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom, he did not always find a receptive audience. Some would listen only to find reasons to accuse him. Jesus, therefore, began to teach publicly in parables. In private, he then would explain many of these parables to his disciples. But the main reason that he did this is because many had become hard of hearing, as the Bible describes it. And despite the evidence to substantiate who Jesus was through the signs as well as through the Bible itself and the preaching and teaching, the record teaches us, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed him not. In all fairness, they had every occasion, and yet there were still some in that very day. They did, not, they did not have the fullness of the evidence as we have today, in the sense that they did not have a written Bible to be able to go to. They did not have all the signs that particular people at that particular time didn't see all the signs, but yet Jesus still had the same problem that we have today. And yet we have the full revelation. We have all the, the miracles and things and signs that are given to us. <clears throat> and yet we have so many today who still have the same problem. They are ignorant of the scripture as well as the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, I can't count the number of times I've been asked questions, something along the lines of, how can anyone who had been a Christian for any length of time, and then they began to leave the church? Why do so many care not to study the Bible and the questions along those kinds of lines? And I have always tried to emphasize that, you know, there is no magical pill or a spell that can be cast upon someone to make them accept the truth and never turn from it. What this all boils down to is the lesson that we're dealing with this morning, and that is some cease to have a good and honest heart. The text we're going to read from is in Luke chapter 8, beginning of verse 4. It says, And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. He said, A sower went forth to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down. And the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And the other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit in a hundredfold. And then he said these things, and when he said these things, he cried, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, The seed is the, the word of God, and those by the wayside are those that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time temptation fall away. And that which falleth among the thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which, with an honest and good heart, having keep uh, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. No man, when he hath lighted the candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth under a bed, or sitteth it on a candlestick, <clears throat> that they which enter may, may see the light. For nothing is secret 
that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known or come abroad. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not for him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain that said, Thy brother, thy mother and thy brethren stood without, desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My brother and my brethren are those which hear the word of God and do it. You know, salvation is to be preached. God's plan for saving man is a preaching plan. Effective preaching demands responsive hearing as well as faithful proclamation of the gospel. The hearer, after he obeys the gospel, must help to produce powerful preaching. <clears throat> there are responsibilities, sadly, today that are placed upon the preacher that are beyond his control. The preacher is nothing more than a proclaimer. He's one that stands in the pulpit each day or in a Bible class or other situations, and he presents the Word of God. But going back to that magic pill, he can't make people accept what he's teaching. And sadly, so many times people will say, well, we hired the preacher. That's why we're, why are you not evangelizing? Why are you not doing this? Well, we hired a preacher. Well, the preacher's not there to do all those things. He's there to proclaim the Word of God. The problem with Jesus <clears throat> we need to realize that sermons are not an end to themselves. They're not exhibits to be observed by curious spectators. They are lessons that are designed to enlighten, to inform, and ultimately, if accepted, to save the hearer. The problem Jesus faced was that many people, though they had the ears to hear, the ability to hear, their ears had become hard of hearing. And the idea here is, is that they had the ability to listen and to understand, and yet they did not. And so Jesus then gives a parable. And we see here that there is nothing wrong with the seed because it was God's Word. The Word is living and powerful and able to save the soul. So then where is the problem? It's not with the sower. Because if he or she is true to the message that he or she is giving, then who's the blame? The blame is to be given to one who hears. The sower is not specifically mentioned here, but compared to Matthew 13, verse 37, and there's an explanation of a parable called the way of the wheat and the tares. And in this, Jesus explains that the sower of the seed, or the good seed, is the son of man. And it is not, it is not unfair to use uh, this parable and apply it to anyone who faithfully proclaims the message of the Son of Man. The seed is the Word of God and was the theme for Jesus' teaching and His preaching. But let's look at the parable. The wayside. The soul represents one who hears and does not understand. I also liken it to the kind of situation where you may see a child who covers up their ears when you're trying to tell them something. This is that type of hearer. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to listen to it. They have most likely those who have hardened their hearts prior to hearing the word. A lot of times when you are speaking to people about the Bible and things, you have some that just walk off. They won't listen to you. That's this kind of hearer. They don't want to hear it. <clears throat> this person's mind is often closed. Sometimes by pride or fear of learning something new. The stony ground, the soil itself represents those who hear the word and respond to it with great joy. They have no root and therefore they will not endure for very long. They fall away. And we find this a lot of times in a situation in dealing with new converts. There is a false impression out there that it's not emphasized enough. Whenever we become a Christian, our problems do not go away. In fact, because we are now a Christian, in many times, many situations, they intensify. 
But there is a miscalculation by some who now they've, be, they've become a Christian. They believe that, well, now all my problems will go away. God's going to take care of everything in my life. And the first time something comes their way, they begin to crumble. Their faith becomes weaker and weaker. They believe that all those things will happen and therefore they'll go away. But what happens in a lot of cases is that they don't count the cost. We need to talk more to people, particularly when they want to become Christians, about the cost it's going to cost them. Jesus dealt with this very thought. In Luke chapter 14, beginning verse 27, it says, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all the behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple." There is no need to emphasize to those who want to obey. There is a great need to emphasize to those who want to obey the gospel, the cost of being a Christian. There are great blessings to come to us in Christ, but it comes with a cost. Then the thorns. This soil represents the one who hears the word, but whose ability to bear fruit is choked by the cares of this world. How can the thorns, how these three types of things happen to a person. The cares of this world can cause us to be unprepared. The evil and cares and anxieties in which they can detract our minds from that which is truly important. The evil of riches lies in diverting our attention away from God and in essence becomes an idol. This is dealt with in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 and following. Then we look at the good ground. The saw represents the one who hears the word and understands it and bears fruit and produces. Luke adds that he hears the word with a good and honest heart and he keeps it and bears, with, bears fruit with patience. Those who have a good and honest heart are those who understand the word. You know, it's interesting to me that God expects us to understand his word. And yet we have so many out here in the world today who say, well, I can't understand the Bible. We can't all understand it alike. And yet God expects that very thing from, him, from those who have a good and honest heart. We need to be like the Bereans who were commended for their fair-minded, their fair-mindedness toward the Scripture. And they received the Word and searched the Scriptures whether those things were so. But what kind of fruit will a person bear? Well, we look at the souls that are one to Christ. The holy life that they live the sharing of their material wealth, as well as the fruit of the Spirit and the good works, along with praise and thanksgiving. And it's interesting that all those who uh, have a good and honest heart, they will produce fruit, yet the Bible teaches us not all of us will pr produce the same amount of fruit. It says that some will produce a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty, Matthew chapter 12. And this is in the parable of the talents, some may, uh, may be given to more uh, according to their ability that God had gives them. And therefore, we must exercise our abilities accordingly. But let's apply this. You know, we must truly understand what God, what Jesus is trying to get forth, get put forth here in his parable. Why are there so many people today who do not have a good and honest heart? Well, some is because of a lack of spiritual perception. Their mind is more on, on physical, material things. You know, you look in John chapter 6, beginning verse 14 and following. Jesus there, he fed the 3,000. And many of them were pressed and they wanted to see Jesus as their king. But what did they see Jesus as? Someone who would feed them. 
They didn't see him for who he was. Well, he could meet their material needs. And who wouldn't want to know that, well, all i got to do is this, and therefore I'll get a free meal. Well, that's what many of them had, that kind of attitude. But his teaching on the bread of life caused many of them to leave. Why? Because he told them you need to work for your food and endure. Well, hold on now. The free lunch is gone. You're telling me I have to work to feed myself? I have to do something in order to have eternal life? And some went away. Sadly today, so many people are looking for material things. They want the church to provide for their physical needs. They want the church to entertain their children. They want the church to offer, if a church offers only the word of God, they look elsewhere, trying to find the church of their choice. You see, their focus is not on spiritual things. It's upon material things. Some, because of fear or moral cowardice, will not apply this, this parable. You know, some are afraid of what other people think. And uh, I think this happens from a very early age. It's, we all just want to get along with everybody. We don't want to stick out, be different than anyone else. The multitude was afraid of what the Jews would think also in, Matthew, in John 7. The parents of the man who was born blind were also afraid to give an answer as to what had happened to him in John 9. Some of the rulers of the days were also afraid of the Pharisees, John chapter 12. Pilate was afraid of Caesar and what he might hear in John chapter 19. You see, many fear what others might think today. They are afraid of what their friends and what they may say to ridicule them. They're afraid of their, what their co-workers may say or do or laugh. Some are afraid of persecution for being politically incorrect or religiously intolerant. Jesus taught his disciples whom they should fear. And the person they should fear is not man, but the person who can destroy the soul. Matthew 10 and verse 28. Within us is a need to be accepted. We don't like to be left out or pushed away. And many, sadly, are going to give up their soul to have the acceptance of the world, of their family, or their so-called friends. Thirdly, some do it because of a misplaced love. You know, their love is, was for the, for the wrong things. They do not have a true love for God. Their love was for such things as evil, darkness, which they did not want to give up. You know, there are so many people in this world, you may talk to them about being a Christian, all these kind of things, and yet there is that nagging thing in the back of their mind, but I've got to give this up. And I really don't want to give that up. And we find that many of these things are sinful practices. They just won't want to give them up. They love things regarding themselves and material things such as Judas. They also come at it from a prejudice or a hardened heart. You know, many people are blinded by Jesus' day, by their prejudice. The Pharisees were hardened by their traditions, making them blind to the miracles that Jesus performed. They were hardened by their prejudice in that they were willing to kill Jesus despite the signs and the miracles and wonders. They were even willing to kill Lazarus in John chapter 12. We look today and we see many that are hardened by their own prejudices today. They hold the traditions and creeds that their denominations teach. And they, they, many of them in the name of the gods that they serve. Today, many believe in evolution and humanism in order to justify their lifestyle. And so many today are unwilling to study the Bible and see whether their cherished beliefs are true. And Jesus warns about those who have hard hearts and blind eyes. Intellectual pride. You know, some are afraid of being thought foolish. If, if you've ever taken a college class, you get a little bit of this arrogance from your college professor. Um, 
You might ask the wrong question, and you'll see his wrath. He'll try to put you down. He'll try to knock you down. You mean, he takes it as a questioning of his authority and those type of things. You know, some are afraid of being looked at as thought foolish. They were, there was a tactic that was used many times to persuade, particularly persuade the soldiers not to believe in John chapter 7. Many were taught to appeal to their wise rulers of the day for answers. The people allow these wise rulers to cause them to doubt what could have been, what they could see with their own eyes and understand clearly, and yet they cause them to doubt. Many today had this same idea. Just take a biology or an ethics class, and the, preacher, the professors then uh, think those who are foolish who hold to the standard other than that which is found in their textbooks or what our modern-day scientists come up with. They are so impressed with so many wise and mighty people in our world, in our history, that do not believe in Jesus. Yet God has purposely chosen the foolish things to save man. God has purposely chosen those things which confound the arrogant and proud scholars of our day. The first Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18. Many of the same people who reject Jesus out of intellectual pride are often guilty of rejecting him for so many reasons. What about ignorance? You know, some rejected Jesus because of their ignorance. They rejected the, they were ignorant of the facts, and that led to their false conclusions, John chapter 7. They thought that Jesus was born in Nazareth, not Bethlehem. They thought him nothing more than a man or a person who consorted with sinful men. Some thought him not the Messiah because he didn't have an, elderly, uh, an earthly throne upon which he was going to sit and reign. What about today? Many people reject Jesus simply because of their ignorance. They don't read the Bible. So how can they know him? They have not considered the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They've accepted the lies that the denominational world has taught them about Christ and about his church. Some, sadly, our own brethren think that Christmas and Easter are God-sanctioned holidays and that we are participate in them as religious holidays. Unlike the noble Bereans, they make little effort at all to look for the facts. So they remain willfully ignorant of all of God's commands. That's where we find, sadly, many in the Lord's church today. They have ceased to have a good and honest heart. So we want to put ourselves to a test this morning. If we want to maintain a good and honest heart, then by implication, we can also lose that good and honest heart. So, ask a few questions. First of all, is your desire to study God's Word and pray diminishing? You know, the Bible is a very unique book. In fact, it is the most unique book of, only, of all. It is a source of information not found anywhere else. Without God's revelation, how could we truly know where we came from? What is our purpose? What is our destiny? It tells us of sin's dreadful consequences of how God saves us from sin. It provides direction for a happy, for living a happy, useful life. And when one loses their desire to study God's word, they have a heart problem. Prayer is a wonderful blessing. An avenue whereby we can communicate with God. Jesus, who loved his father very well, very much, often prayed. His expression, he, he expressed concern that his disciples would not grow weary to pray. And when the, when the Christian prays and studies less, his heart is starting to fade. You know, I, I, I've never seen the amount of having to beg and uh, beg people to do something that should be very um, a part of our lives every day as a Christian. And yet we are having to beg so many people just read the Bible. That's so basic. Secondly, 
is our desire to be with God's people diminishing. You know, this includes attending God, the services where God's people come to worship. One should always be excited and looking forward to being with saints like the psalmist was in one, in one chapter, Psalm 122 and verse 1. You know, if we no longer rejoice in the worship of God in the presence of his brethren, we are losing our heart. Fellowship with God's people extends beyond the services of the local congregation. We are to be concerned with edifying one another. We should seek out to edify others on a daily basis. We should be looking constantly for the right kind of friendship that will strengthen us and not lead us to sin. And when a Christian prefers the companionship of people of the world rather than fellow Christians, he's losing his heart. Thirdly, is our desire to share the gospel diminishing? You know, when one obeys the gospel, he knows that God has bought out his sins. He has made a new creature in Christ. He wants to shout from the rooftops that he is now saved and then seeks out anyone that he comes in contact with to talk about what they have just done. During different times of his life, he might find himself not as willing to talk to others, overlooking opportunities that are presented to him to teach others about the gospel. If that desire to tell others about Christ is waning, we might have a heart problem. Fourthly, is our desire for spiritual things diminishing? You know, some have such a thrill living in a world because of what it has to offer and give little or no thought to what God wants us to be thrilled about. Parents are very concerned with what their children in school are making all A's on the report card and being well-rounded students. But complaints that the Bible class teachers that their child is not participating or even coming prepared to, to study are made to deaf ears. You know, I, I personally have seen this. I have a wife that teaches. I know a lot of school teachers. There is a lot of effort parents give toward their kids and their education. And I, I have nothing against education. But I also look on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights in Bible class and see kids that don't bring their Bibles. They don't bring anything to write on. They don't come with a mind to study. And yet the parents then say when their children are not developing spiritually, who do they begin to blame? It's not their fault. It's the church's fault. The elders didn't do enough. The Bible class teacher didn't do enough. When it boils down to what are you doing to prepare your children for Bible class, for worship? Are you doing those things at home? Are you preparing them? You know, I look also and see that attendance is mandatory in a lot of our minds when it comes to worship, except when there's a big test on the horizon. Or when vacation time is here. You know, we're going to take off and go such and such. Well, they take a vacation from church also, from worship. And within the passing of time, the entire family is so full of emotion over worldly matters and not spiritual matters. You know, we are warned about the love of the world and the things of this world, 1 John 2, verse 15 and 17. Such is the, the way of so many today who profess to be Christians. But the world seems to be more important than any other thing in their life. Paul describes some who were lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 4. You know, if we reach a point where we find more pleasure in some worldly activity than meeting with others to worship God, we may have a heart problem. What can the Christian do to remedy the problem of the heart? Well, first, we need to keep working and remain diligent. We need to abound in the Christian graces, 2 Peter 1, verse 5 and 8. There is no place for retirement in the life of a faithful Christian. Second, we need to watch out for those things which will tempt us. 
We must be on guard against temptation. We have a fleshly nature that wars that wages war against the soul. 1 Peter 2 and verse 11. Third, we must be ready to go against the tide. There are many tides that can sweep us away. Popularity, peer pressure, the praise of others, modernism, skepticism, humanism, denominationalism, liberalism, and all the other types of things out there, worldliness and neglect, to just name a few. And all of these are what the majority seeks out to guide their hearts. And we must be certain to stand against those things. And then we must also be strong and rooted in God's word. We must be rooted in Christ. We must have our minds anchored in the truth. And we must possess an unshakable hope. And we must be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. So we ask the question, do we have a heart problem? The danger is very real. We would be foolish to say otherwise. The many who have drifted away from the Lord, we would be arrogant to say that this cannot happen to me. Are there signs of it in our lives? And if there are, we need to repent and come back to God. Come back to the Bible. Pray and be with God's people who can strengthen and encourage us to follow Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if, by the, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense or reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him. Brethren, our salvation in Christ is simply too great for us to neglect. We must examine our hearts and make sure that we do all we can to remain faithful to Jesus Christ. Thank you for your attention.